from each of the, as we progress along the timeline from early to late, uh, and we think they're interesting. And we're going to talk about them. We'll show you, we'll talk about it a little bit. And we also want to show you uh, the different contexts in which they were used. So, fencing was used for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, some of these techniques were used for training, right? You had to train to become a good fencer. The Italians were very big on this. They had fencing schools. For example, if you attended the University of Bologna, one of the most prestigious universities and earliest universities in Europe, you had to take fencing. It was part of your curriculum. Is your outfit after to a certain time period? So, yeah, so I'm, the, the, uh, I, my outfit I'm dressed in would be around the early 1400. So, figure around 1410, 1420. So, um, and I'm dressed as uh, a, a sort of an Italian condottieri, so an Italian mercenary knight, basically, or men in arms. I wear armor, obviously. Um, another context would be dueling. Uh, dueling was huge. It was the way that knights and later gentlemen settled uh, decisions of honor, and so we're going to be looking at dueling, was very prominent. We're going to be looking at self defense, uh, because uh, late medieval and early and Renaissance Italy was an incredibly dangerous place with tons of violence. Uh, factional and otherwise, so you always had to be worried about someone trying to assassinate you, uh, especially if you were important. And then the last is going to be sort of not true battlefield necessarily, because that's a little bit different, but uh, like small skirmish type of combat where a small group of people fighting another small group of people. That could be part of organized factional violence, it could be a small portion of a battlefield. We're going to show you all that stuff. Um, and hopefully you'll find it interesting and we'll take questions at the end. Uh, we might take questions in a minute too. Uh, so to start off, the first thing that we're going to show is uh, the, earliest, the earliest stuff is from an Italian fencing master named Fiore de Liberi. Fiore de Liberi uh, was born around 1340, right, out, right around the time of the Black Death, uh, and he died in 1320, and in his old age, uh, he, uh, he created several fencing treatises. Uh, one that we're called Flower Battle. So we're working on the first, we think, probably the first edition, which was uh, 1304. And he shows mostly longsword fighting, in and out of armor. So the first thing that we're going to demonstrate is, and uh, Peter's going to be here right here. He's going to go up here and demonstrate for He's got a longsword. The longsword is a, one of the buttons we're going to send you down to Peter. Why don't you face it that way, because the sword's going to get that way. So then we get your turn. Yeah, and then face that way. You're going to face that way. Yep, that's where the sword gets. Yeah. Uh, so, in his manuscript, well, yeah, one of the things here to show is this is a long sword. So, a long sword, in this context, is a hand and a half sword. It is a knightly sidearm uh, that can be used with one or two hands. It has to be short enough that you can wear it around, uh, either on foot or on horseback, but long enough that you can put a second hand on it uh, for increased leverage. Um, later, these swords get longer, but right now they're sort of this, in this hand and a half. But he's showing how to use it in one hand. And uh, in his manuscript, he basically shows Fiore in his sword in one hand guard, and he's facing three opponents. <laughs> and each opponent's going to attack him a different way. And Fiore says in his, in his manuscript, uh, I can stand in this guard, and this guard is so strong that he basically says, you are all cowards and know nothing of the art of fencing, and I will defeat you all if you come at me one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> So clearly he's using this sort of to demonstrate the technique. He's not going to realistically fight all three of these people at the same time because he would be killed. But uh, the, first thing, the first thing he's going to do is going to defend himself against a thrust. So we're going to go slow first, and he'll counter, and then we will do it the second time a little bit faster. Next is going to be a cut. And the third time, he's going to defend himself against a thrown sword. So you may think, thrown sword. <laughs> Uh, sword throwing was a historical technique. Uh, it's probably a technique of last resort. It's probably not the first thing you want to do. <laughs> probably a bad idea. Uh, but they are surprisingly effective throwing weapons if you are relatively close. You can, we've done some experiments with sharp swords, and they won't stick in things. You throw them for a little practice. All right, so we're going to go again at speed.
So what they, some of the things I want to uh, uh, talk about what happened there is, you notice he defended against all three attacks the same way, all right? So what he did is he used the true edge of his sword, that is the sword, the leading edge of his sword, and he beat the enemy's sword uh, weapon away from below while stepping off to the side. So the, the void piece is important because if your cover fails, you don't want to be there where the weapon arrives, right? You're, you're moving out of the way, but you're also covering. Uh, and then he responds the same way as well. He responds with an overhand thrust downward into the face or chest of the I want you to remember this. You're going to see it again and again and again and again. We're going to talk about it a little bit later on in the program. This is sort of like the universal Italian uh, sword in one hand play. Defend from a low guard rising, or well, could be from rising or falling, but defend from the left and then attack with an overhand thrust. Because an overhand thrust is incredibly difficult to parry. Uh, it's, a hard, uh, it's a hard attack to parry. You go over the top of your opponent's sword and you stab him, um, as uh, one of the later fencing masters says, in his most noblest parts. <laughs> you aim his eyes and then you stab and you hit him in the face of the chest. All right, so that's our first, uh, our first now. Any questions about that? All right, so we're gonna move on to the second part. Where I'm gonna run. Uh, and we're gonna show you uh, Fiore's a sword in armor play. I'll take that. So again, we're using long swords, uh, except we're gonna be using them in two hands now. So again, Fiore was mainly concerned about training people to fight armor and win tools. Uh, he has armor fencing as well. That's armor fencing and long swords. Kind of stupid. Uh, because you basically die and kill each other. Uh, so he says if you're fighting a duel, it's much better to fight, so you'd rather fight three duels in armor than one duel in armor. Uh, but then he goes on to say how he fought five duels in kind of armor than one, so, you know, <laughs> um, So, using the long sword in armor, it's important to understand that it is not a primary weapon, okay? Uh, in a lot of shows and movies, the sword is always like the primary weapon, right? In most cases, with some exceptions, a sword is a side weapon. It's a secondary weapon. It's a backup weapon, right? Because you can't cut armor, right? Unless you have a lightsaber. Right? So you cannot cut armor. So how do we use these swords when we're fighting armor? Well, we had pole axes or spears, and then we lost them in the exchange because they're heavy and we knocked out our hands and we draw our swords. So we're, we, we do a technical half sword. So that is where you hold the sword in two hands, and you use it basically like a really long dagger. So you can control and put the point in, and you're thrusting at gaps in the armor. Or, because a lot of people in armor fought either with open-faced helmets in this time period, or they took their visors off. You may think, why would you do that? Because that exposes your face, right? It's so you can breathe and so you can see. Uh, they wear their visors often when they were mounted, or in the initial missile exchange, or shooting arrows, so no one wants to take an arrow in the face. But the second you dismount, you take it off so you can see what you're doing. But that leaves a vulnerable gap. So we're going to show you how that would be exploited. Once again. So I cover the strike. Now, he's not trying, he's not actually planning on cutting me because I'm wearing a helmet, but he can still concuss me. He can still bring my bell. Or he just may not be very smart, which is good for me. Now, he might have a visor on. Okay, so some people can occasionally wear visors. One thing that did not exist as far as we know in this time period were visor locks. They do show up later, like a catch where you can like lock your visor down. So, bam, his, he's got a visor, right? So I'm in this position. I simply let go with my lead hand, sweep the visor up, and, sh and then just put my sword as a way of thinking. Now, another way the sword can be used, he's just going to demonstrate by killing me, is he can turn it around and hold the blade hand and use it as a war hammer to strike me with the crossbar. These are occasionally in some sort of actually sharpened. So you can smash people in the face. You don't actually have to sharpen them to be dangerous. And in the German defense technique, this is called the merge strike, the merge strike. hit me in the helmet with that, I would have been killed or concussed. But, and what Pete does, if you do it more slow motion, just do the murder stroke. He 
she pulls my sword down, breaking my structure, getting me off balance, smashes me in the face with the pommel, and staggers me. And then he doesn't get me down, he pins my sword, wraps it around my neck, and then he cuts my throat if I don't have a good idea. He gets under my apple tail or just throws me to the ground. Um, One other thing to show you just really quickly um, is the Rondo dagger. That's the other sidearm. The other sidearm the knights would have is uh, would have for armor fighting, and it's a about a 12 inch long dagger. It's often um, triangular in profile. It doesn't have an edge. Some have edges, but a lot of them didn't. And it's basically a can opener. Uh, it's designed to get into the gaps, pry. So when he got me down on the ground, he probably would have gotten down on my chest, pulled his Rondo dagger out, and either you know, shank me in my bone spots. Or, what was even more likely, is he would have demanded that I yield so he could ransom me. It was a very common practice, even on the battlefield, not just in duels, um, for knights to actually not kill each other. One, you're super hard to kill in armor. It's extremely difficult. So you almost have to be unlucky. Uh, and they would actually ransom each other because there's a good chance to be annihilated or related. We're like third cousins, twice removed, or something like that. We actually have more in common than like, that we do with peasants from our country, right? And uh, I'm worth a lot of money. So I yield, then we're like boys now, and then, uh, <laughs> right? and then he hands me out to the squire, and I get sent to the back, and then I hang out with him for like six months in his castle, <laughs> drinking, going hunting, doing that kind of stuff, until my people raise the money, and he gets sent to a Florentine bank, and he gets transferred, and then I get to go home, and then the next time I catch him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll show you one other cool sword thing. Alright. We're going to do this a little bit slower. Uh, uh, and I'm not wearing a mask, I'm going to kill Okay, so Pete is going to do the same. He's going to strike me, I'm going to cover, I'm going to displace, I go thrust him, but he's got a visor on, right? So the tank, it doesn't kill him. This is no good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive my sword through, I'm going to crank it over like this. Now I've got to be, uh, and I take my dagger out and start punching balls in the back of his head. Or, hey man, yield? Yeah. Alright, let's go hunt. <laughs> Good job, bro. Alright. <laughs> Better luck next time. Uh, Alright, so now we're going to have a question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Did the, the leather gloves that they wore, were they, were they strong enough to not be cut when they held the blade? Yes. So, um, sword grabbing. So, there's a good chance, no matter what, even if you're out of armor, you're probably going to have a pair of leather gloves on. Maybe not, you probably will, because people think, if you're a gentleman, you can go out without gloves on, because you don't want to touch like dirty peasants and stuff, right? But just protect your hands. If you're riding, you're working with weapons. That's sort of an indication. That's not exactly the sort of weapon, but it's close. Um, and sword grabbing. Um, so, if you're on a long sword, so I'm not wearing armor. I probably have gloves on, but maybe not. This is a technique. So I, I reach up, I slap the blade with my palm, squeeze it, right, put a bend in it, so it can't really draw it, crank to my hip, and then I don't really yield, or I just can't yeah, work. You can do whatever I feel. So uh, grabbing swords was a thing. If you're wearing gauntlets, they have leather palms similar to the gloves you've been wearing out of armor. Yeah. So remember also that the longsword is a fundamentally specialized anti-armor side for at least the class of people that Fiore was writing about. So they would have a thick diamond-shaped cross-section, and the edge exists, but it could be even like butter by belt um, on some surviving examples like that. Some of them were a little more cutty, some of them were a little more stabby, but uh, it, it could even be a fundamentally dull blade with something like S stock, which is one that is totally specialized in its rest. There's even specialized ones where uh, the blade will be sharp and then it kind of has a little notch specifically for your hand to fit in. So it's made for you to hold and you get this little handle built into the blade so it's nice and comfortable to hold while the rest of the blade is sharp. He already even shows a, uh, in his, one of his manuscripts, a special, a special armor fighting blue sword where it has essentially a rondo dagger grip mounted on it. And so what you can do is you can grab that and go shh and it locks forward so you have the rondo dagger grip here. So this is your rondo dagger now and this is like your lever for grabbing.
graphic and depressing. And then they put like, spikes on the back, and it looks like a third grade too. Like, so now we're going to jump forward in time. So we went big jump actually, uh, because it did, combat didn't change much in terms of sword fighting for, for quite a while. Um, swords start to get longer, long swords start to get longer and longer, and they become less um, uh, hand and half swords and more like dedicated to hand swords uh, through the middle of the century. And by the time you get to the 1500s, um, you still see the hand and a half armored long swords for armored combat, but for unarmored combat, for dueling, for other stuff, there are more these uh, cutting only two handed swords. But the one handed sword is evolving too. From the army sword, or the standard knightly sword, or spada, which is basically a long sword with a short handle, or a long sword is just a regular sword with a long handle, right? But someone's like, hey, we're fighting without armor on all the time. Um, we have no hand protection, except for our crosshair. So our hands get cut a lot in that scenario, right? So they start to add hand protection. The first thing they do is they start putting finger rings on here. So you can wrap, you can wrap the finger around the crosshair. Uh, this seems to be a particularly Italian thing. Italians like to finger the guard, as we say. And there's <laughs> art uh, going back to the 1300s with guys pulling army swords, fingering the guard. So I'll show this to both sides of the room, but check out what happens when I put my index finger over the guard. See the angle between my forearm and the board? <coughs> and then when I put a finger over the guard, it tips forward. So if I'm primarily focused on thrusting, it actually creates a better angle to do that. So the other side of the room. It also makes, it also gives you greater leverage, so doing like wrist cuts are a lot easier. <clears throat> Anyways, so then the next thing they do is they start putting more fancy stuff. All right, they start putting finger rings and ports. These are called here, additional side rings to continue to protect the hand, and thus you get the evolution of what we call the side sword. This is the, like most names of most swords. These are modern inventions. Um, the Italians would not call this a side sword, nor they would call that an army sword, nor would they call it a long sword. They would call that a spada. They would call that a spada, and this also would have been. A spot. <laughs> <laughs> right? If I use that sword in two hands, they would call it a spada a dubimani, a sword in two hands. And if I use it in one hand, it would be a spada a mano, or a one hand. Right? So, so these are swords that basically historians and archaeologists and people like, invent so we can understand what the differences are. But we call this a side sword. This is like the proto rapier. This is the beginning of what will then turn into rapier. Um, so, Ian yeah, is going to show you. I'll turn it over to Ian. Okay. Um, so remember at the start you mentioned that um, some fencing systems were actually enshrined in the university. So uh, in the part of the education of a nobleman in Renaissance Italy, a very important uh, aspect of that was learning how to use weapons. Um, as the noble class, their business was warfare primarily. Um, so what I'm going to show now is uh, an example of what's called an abbattimento or an assalto. Uh, which is uh, basically it's a memory device. It's a way to remember a series of actions. Uh, I'll show it once all the way through and then we'll break it down. These were both paired exercises and solo practice forms. So it's something that, you know, you go back to your dorm in uh, 16th century Italy after your sword class with Professor so and so, um, and then you can practice this on your own. That's a Professor Darty. Yeah, Professor Darty. Uh, we actually do have records, so there's this, uh, there's the idea, whether or not it was how people in the era thought of it. We uh, see this thread of similar material, similar guard names and actions, uh, that uh, modern people have labeled the Bolognese School, because the University of Bologna had um, a, a guy named Darty, and he was a professor of, I believe, astronomy and, and architecture, maybe, at the university, and then he also taught medicine. His students then wrote books, and they said, you know, we, we memorialize this to Darty. Uh, and so that, there's some questions about whether or not that's real or if it's just a modern farce, uh, you know, history. So here we go.
there's really kind of three sections to this, um, all of which are relevant for the sword in one hand. And uh, this comes from Akilah Marazzo's book in 1536. Um, oh, sorry, good question. I noticed you had your hand on your hip the whole time. Was that, was that, is that just a stylistic thing, or does it serve some kind of purpose? It's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think partially both. Uh, so we do have records from the Anonimo Bolognese, uh, possibly written by Darby himself. Um, it was an uncompleted book. And he describes the Bolognese attitude, which is why <laughs> some people already know. The Bolognese attitude is one of haughtiness and uh, graceful violence. <laughs> right? The idea is that every motion should carry with it the threat of crippling injury. And so as I come out to fence, I've got my hands here, I'm very, you know, very poised. I don't care that we're fighting with sharp swords and one of us is about to die, right? It doesn't matter to me. Um, simultaneously, the real thing that it does is it makes my posture good. You can actually do this sitting down. Go ahead and stick your hand behind your back and feel what it does to your shoulders and your chest. Yeah. Right? It's an immediate training device to make you use good, good posture. So, great question. Alright, so then uh, there's three parts of this exercise. There's the false edge cuts, or the falsy from each side. If I can get some to grab this. So my friend Mike here points the sword at me. I don't like that it's pointed at me, so I'm going to take the back edge of my sword, the false edge, and I'm going to say, kill it. Right? If it's pointed at me again, I might say, get away to that side. <laughs> so uh, the first section teaches us how to throw a falso followed by a forehand cut from each side, how to throw a falso followed by a backhand cut from each side. Right, so nice and simple. The next section is defenses against the thrust, which all come from this basic idea. I have my left foot forward and I'm presenting the inside. Mike tries to stab me and I put my sword across the line protecting me from his thrust. And then I follow up with various things, maybe a thrust, maybe a backhand cut. Um, that's the second section. And then the last is safe attack formula. So um, basically I need to either jam into Mike's face in order to prevent him from being able to load the cut, which is what I do in the first one. I step in, cut out his hand so that he pulls his hand away. And that gives me the opportunity to his life. I um, or I can deflect this off of the back side. Remembering the first play that we showed from Fiore, I touch false edge to false edge, and I give an overhand thrust. We may have seen that before someplace. Mike being a smart fencer, I touch the false edge, and as I thrust, he doesn't want to get stabbed, so he pushes my point away. When he pushes my point away, I can cut him in the head, and I redouble it in case I didn't get the job done the first time. Um, and then as he responds in any manner, remembering the false edge parry from Fiore in the first demonstration, I smack it out of the way, I cut him, and then because I don't want him to follow me if I've missed, I threaten to stab him in the face. or a big sword in Italian, so there's five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show the difference. Yeah, so you can, see it, you can see a difference in scale. As spadones go, this is actually a fairly small one. This is a shorter spadone. They get longer as time goes on. Uh, the Spaniards call them montantes. In German, uh, they're zweihanders. And those things are ridiculously well. They're like as tall as maybe six feet long and weigh up to five to six pounds. Uh, so those are really big swords. Uh, just a note. Swords are lighter than you think. Uh, like a, that long, long sword we're playing with historically, they were two and a half, three pounds, maybe three and a half pounds. They're not these big, massive, heavy swords. Yes. 
So what happens is they, they cease to be a sidearm, right? So they're no longer a sidearm, and they become a, even more specialized than a longsword, a primary weapon, either of an infantry mercenary soldier, like the famous German Landeschnacht uh, mercenaries, who their uh, Dauphin soldiers, they're, they're, they're big, they use the two-handed swords, they would protect standards with them and do other stuff like that. Uh, they were used by Marines in naval combat, on galleys, the Venetians, which we'll show you a little bit of that later. Uh, they were used with bodyguard weapons, because they were, they, were, they were really excellent for controlling space. They were like an area weapon, rather than a precision weapon. I mean, you can, you can still precision strikes them, but you can control an area. We'll show you that too. <laughs> but we're going to show you next that people duel with them. There was a period of time in the beginning of the 16th century where it was cool, if you were a gentleman, to duel with spadown heads with big swords. Um, and even as late as the 17th century, where the uh, Italian uh, rapier um, uh, master for Thabras with Greece, uh, instead of being shown drawn with a rapier, he's shown drawn with a big two-handed sword. There seems to have been some cachet uh, established with being able to use these two handed swords. So, Max, the here again, is a big Italian sword player. <laughs> and this is from the same book as that single-handed sword method. He's in kind of a point forward guard, presenting me the right side. So I dip my point straight in at his face, knowing that he's going to parry. That may give me the opportunity to cut him in the head, but he leaves. Basically, these swords are heavy enough that I can't just stay here, right? If I lift my hands, I may not get hit in the head, or I may still get hit in the head because it's heavy. So I'm not just going to put my hands up. I'm going to get out of the way. So I hit him. He just turns his hands to the other side. Because his hands are raised, I can step back a little bit, and I'm going to step out and try to take those hands. And since he's smart, he'll just leave. That's the first play. And the second play that we're showing is actually the counter to that first play which all hinges off the idea that I don't get rolling, right? If I get this flow of action going, he's following what I'm telling him to do, so he's gonna counter immediately on the first action. By threatening to stab me. I pull my hands up in order to not be stabbed, which prevents them. So he tries to take my hands out. I leave. I see the possibility of entering again. He bounces in and takes the center line. So he could be threatening a stab here. So I lift my hands, cut to the other side, and once again, boom, that false cut takes me. Chaos between cities. Uh, 
there was a, an Italian culture called the Vendetta, wow. which would mean that like, uh, if I go kill Adrian's brother in a duel, then he gets his whole family, and they come over to my city, and they just try and murder my whole family. <laughs> and like, when you have lots of rich people all trying to murder each other, it's just not, it's not good. The problem is, dueling is really cool, people, people have always loved fighting, uh, and love showing off their skill. And in Italy, the, for, for a while, the peak way of showing off how good you were was not to fight with one sword, but to fight with two swords. <laughs> right? Because, like, there's nothing cooler than two swords. We still see this in Hollywood today. Everybody loves fighting with two swords. So we're going to walk you through how to actually fight with two swords. Uh, but before that, we're going to give you a, a little famous story of one of the one of the most famous duel spots with two swords that, that Ian will kind of tell you guys about. Yeah, we're going to do it. Yeah, do you guys want to take the board? So again, this is from the city of, uh, well, there's a Bolognese connection. Um, there was this guy named this guy named Cordia, uh, who actually, later on in his career, led the campaign against uh, the Turks when they were coming into the Mediterranean. Uh, this was a very bad man, um, you can find out if you look at his later life, uh, but he's kind of that first example of a person pulled out of prison. Uh, he was so bad that they pulled him specifically out of prison to fight the Turks. Um, because of other bad things he did. At the age of 19, however, uh, in 1535, um, he had started his career as a professional soldier. He worked as a standard bearer, so he was the guy who wrote the flags. Um, that was actually a very important position, A, because you don't engage in combat, and B, because, uh, you know, like, heroism, you've got the standards, etc. He worked his way up until he was a captain with over 200 soldiers under his command, and then got into a little bit of a tip with his commanding officer. Um, and so, what this actually led to, uh, he was in prison, he was let go, he was in prison again, and then because he's a noble, then he can say, all right, my commanding officer who keeps imprisoning me, we're going to have to fight this out. So they engaged in a duel uh, in, a, in the piazza in Bologna uh, with two swords. So one was this more complicated hilt type like this, and the other one is what's called a mezza spada, which is basically a very large dagger or just a regular side sword, depending on who you look at. We have a painting, um, and it is probably something closer to that. Um, was actually wounded in this duel and then proceeded to do, we keep coming back to this one true play, he parried with a false edge uh, and then delivered an overhand thrust, hitting his uh, captain in the stomach and ended the duel. And uh, the seconds called out and said, all right, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all friends here. No need to, you know, murder this general. Um, and after uh, some deliberation, uh, the seconds on the general side said, uh, he cannot ask for mercy, that would be too embarrassing. <laughs> so to kind of think about the culture of this period, asking for mercy is too embarrassing, so they said instead, let him ask for forgiveness. And Ascanio accepted this only after publicly shaming him and saying, you need to yell this so that everybody <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, so after that little story, we're going to kind of talk about some of the techniques. As Ian alluded to, uh, there's various types of weapons that you can have in your offhand, and the two-handed fighting style is designed to utilize anything from a dagger up to a full second sword. So sometimes, uh, like if you're going around town and you're a gentleman, you're going to have something like this which is just going to be your standard uh, kind of dagger. It might have a little bit of a hilt on it. You can see this has uh, a ring to help protect my hand. Uh, and usually I would either be wearing this on my left hip or kind of on the small of my back like this to make it real nice and easy to grab. Uh, the daggers can also get like this long and that's one that I would wear uh, also like right in front of my belly. So it has a similar look to if you've seen uh, traditional art in Japan where you wear your katana and wakazashi kind of on top of each other like this. It's a similar style where like I just have my really big knife and my also my sword so that I can get them both 
uh, simultaneously. But you have the evolution from small knife to big knife to small sword to equal size sword. Uh, and the system is designed that you can use any one of those in the duel because what would happen is, you know, if Pete and I have to duel, one of the two of us is going to get to pick the weapon. So I, I have to be trained in small dagger, medium dagger, and sword. Uh, so when we're, when we're talking about fighting with two swords, we kind of have a, a different problem than when there's only one. Can you hear that? Can you back up a little bit? Zero percent. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So when, uh, if Pete only has one sword, right? If Pete only has one sword, <coughs> this whole part of his body is open, so I can kind of attack him over here. The problem is when he has two swords, I, that, that opening is a lot more difficult to get to. So when you're fighting with two swords, there's three kind of positions that you can hang out in. One is like this, where I'm deliberately exposing the right side of my body, right? I have one sword high, one sword low. You have the mirrored side, one, one high, one low, exposing my side. And then the third is both swords in the center. Uh, you, you get this alternation because a lot of the fencing system is about creating an opening to bait your opponent into attacking that specific position. Uh, you get the middle one because when people are scared, they put their swords in front of them and try and create as much space as possible. Uh, this is really common. We see this a lot today when we're training in a modern sense, is that for people who are new, the most comfortable place to be is like this, with any sword, like, stay away from me, I'm kind of nervous. So you also find this position uh, to be pretty common. So if we go through and we talk about the defenses against uh, the different types of actions that you might see. So for example, if I'm here and Pete, I'm, right now I'm exposing the left side of my body, right? So Pete is going to attack my left side of the body. I'm going to take my higher sword, I'm going to intercept this blow. And what I'm doing is I'm, my goal is to move to the outside of his body based on whichever side he's attacking me from. So he attacked me from his right, so I'm moving aggressively to, to his right, my left. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push him away so that this sword, I don't even care about that sword. He can't really hit me with that sword. And then I'm just going to gut him. Right? So again, a little bit faster, he cuts at me. I got him. Or the other option is I can also cut him. Cut him across the face however I want. The whole point is that I'm moving away from his body uh, in as safe a way as possible. Uh, if, he, if I'm over here and he cuts me uh, to my right side, which, yeah. Right, I'm here, I've covered myself, I can cut him in the leg, or I can gut him over here. You can see that the principle is the same. I'm moving towards whichever side of his body uh, he's attacking me. Right? And it doesn't matter which angle of his cuts he throws, I simply beat it at the leg and cut him. Uh, one other thing that's important here is I'm not attacking him with the same sword that I defended with. Right, so if we do that same one, right, what I'm not doing is cutting down with this sword, because what that does is it frees up this whole side of my body from him to attack. So I keep this sword covering my, this sword on this side of the body, and I attack him with my other. This is the biggest advantage of having two weapons, is that you can just use one of your swords to defend yourself at all times and attack with the other one and put yourself in a really safe position. Uh, so that's defending. Uh, if I want to attack, right, if he is in this kind of high-low position, what I need to do is I need to, again, control his sword in a way that keeps me safe, but also creates an opening. So if we're here, what I want to do is I need to move away from this one. This is actually the sword that is more threatening even though it's farther away, because this is the distraction. But what I need to do is I need to distract his own distraction. I need to deceive him like this, right? So I'm gonna thrust at this shoulder 
real close to this sword so that I can get away from the scary sword, come over here, cut him in the leg, and walk away. Uh, we get instructions a lot to cut the leg in this system, and every time we do, he says, you cut him in the leg and take three or four steps back. And then you do the whole thing again. And like, imagine the frustration of it. This is the duel. Just over and over again. Uh, cut him in the leg, and eventually your leg stops working. Right? So same thing on the other side, right? I thrust here, and I can cut him in the head, I can cut him in the leg. Either way, I'm moving away from the more threatening sword and keeping my sword in between these. So the last one is what if he's in the center guard, right? He's a little afraid of me, uh, or maybe he's not used to fighting with two swords. What do I do, right? I'm like, oh, okay, we're fighting in the center like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to thrust at him with both my swords. This is the only time we're ever told to attack at the same time with both weapons, but you'll see why it works. Right, we're like this, and I'm gonna thrust this in with both my swords, crossing them so that I control it. And then I simply push both his swords to the side, and now I'm in the position I've been trying to get to the whole time. The outside of his body, both his swords on my side, and I can cut him in the head, I can cut him in the leg, I can gut him, my three options, always the same. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> So we're going to kind of do a, uh, we're going to go back to that idea of the universal carry that you've stood in a couple times, and we're going to show it in its various incarnations over the scope of the time commencing uh, in this time period. Uh, we're going to start by going back to Fiore, uh, with the sword in one hand. Uh, so I'll be Fiore, and Ian's going to be the person who has coward in the art, which is not true. Being nice and not stabbing. <laughs> so, so. so again, it's, it's the same idea that we're seeing over and over and over again. I'm beating uh, his sword to the outside, I'm passing out, and the entire side of his body is open, which allows me then to strike safely because I'm controlling the sword and it cannot strike me. And I need to place the point in the overhand cross, which you see is sort of widely considered across all the Italian sources. Uh, particularly the later ones, to be the best attack. Like, it is the like, most OP attack there is, is the Embracada, this overhand thrust over the top of the weapon. Uh, and uh, yeah, we see this over and over and over again. So the next thing we're going to move, a little, we're going to jump up to uh, the Anonymous. Uh, or no, Manchalino. Manchalino. So we're jumping ahead to the uh, first basic side sword. So we are now at 1531. So once again, I'll put the weapon on the left side of my body, and then whatever happens... Again, so he, he creates an opening, and I'm like, oh, I can hit him there. No, I can't. And he's dead. Or, uh, Mancilino also gives us the other option here, just like Fiore. I beat the sword. One of the nice things about the geometry of the human body and holding swords is, Typically, if you cut a descending cut at some angle at their head, and you happen to just be a little bit too short, you're going to hit their arm. It's just where, the, where it works out. You're going to cut their sword arm, which honestly is just as good, because they can't hold the sword uh, if they don't have a sword arm. <laughs> Disarm. Uh, Disarm. Uh, keep it easy. So a couple of years later, another student of the same master, Morazzo, um, if we return to the single sword, he's covering the inner line, I'm covering the inner line, I'm going to connect our false edge. Um, it actually, Morazzo colorfully says, uh, kiss their false edge with yours. You know, it's a very loving, tender art. <laughs> <laughs> and then I pass and deliver this one. Yeah. 
All right, so then we are going to jump ahead again, so we have a little bit more fancier swords now. As you notice, as time goes on, this is not always true. We see, still see similar hilts all the way into the, the 1600s, but generally speaking, the later we get, the more complex the, uh, the hilts go, the more protective the hilts get. So, uh, so the, what we're going to show next is from... I'm going to do uh, Vigiani. Okay, so we're going to do Vigiani. Okay. So uh, Vigiani in 1567 actually built an entire fencing system around this idea. Um, so we're going to demonstrate it here. I go into a defensive guard, anything on the left side of my body, and then regardless of what he does, I'm going to pass off the line and bring my feet together. And this is one of the first instances where we see the lunge. So my sword is high and pointed at him, and I do a lunge. Is that one more time? One thing we see as we get into the middle of the 16th century is uh, a, ch a change in emphasis from cutting and for cutting and thrusting being sort of treated almost equally, maybe even a little more emphasis on cutting, to a more thrust-centric style of fencing, uh, where we're looking more at using the point rather than using the edge. Uh, and we see this in Vig uh, Vigiani, and we also see it in this, in this other contemporary of his, uh, Giovanni Galagaki, who Vigiani actually wrote this book earlier, but then told his brother not to publish it until 10 years after his death. So uh, Delagaggi's actual book comes out slightly before, even though it's actually later, if that makes sense. Anyways, so with Delagaggi, we see, again, another variation on essentially the same play. So again, I pass with my left foot to move my body out of the way of the strike, and then I cover with a reverso to make the strike, uh, strike from the left, uh, offsetting his sword, and it puts me in the perfect position to again thrust him with the imbricata. Uh, I could also, if I wanted to, I could cut him in the head and cut him in the arm as well. And actually, uh, if you see here, in this part, I will actually strike him, I can actually strike him in the neck or the face and the arm with one strike. At the same time. Uh, and then so the evolution adding all of these things assume that I'm at least a little bit to Adrian's uh, outside. Yes. So what happens if I start moving towards the inside? Giovanni Dalgaki gives us a solution. So again, if he, if he starts coming to the side, I cannot, because it's, it's essential for me to make the reversal parry, I have to move my body to the left, that's what it's for, right? But if he's moving to the left, I can't move to the left, because I won't feel really say outside of me, I'm still going to hit. So instead, when he cuts at me, I simply turn my left leg behind my front leg, turning my body, fully extending my arm, and catching his sword on my cross guard, and driving, driving my point directly into his throat uh, or his chest. So the harder forward, the, the harder my motion forward is, the likelier it is that I'll be caught on the stop thrust. And um, one of these guys often says in the strip, he says he always likes you, uh, whenever you have your right leg forward, to bring your left leg behind, turning your body. He says that way you defend and attack at the same time by simply moving your primary target away from your opponent. Maybe, and also with your heart so here too, you know, instead, you want to move your heart away from uh, getting crossed. So that is the universal parry we're doing. So we've got nearly 200 years of different authors showing the same technique. And that leads us into our next section, uh, which Mike will be demonstrating using a layered weapon. pretty protected, uh, but the sword is kind of balanced for cut and thrust, right? The wide blade allows you to be effective when you're cutting, but the, the triangular tapered point means that it's also good for thrusting. 
Now, swords like this continue to be effective uh, both as civilian weapons and as battlefield weapons for quite a long time. But what happens is, as I talked about before, uh, dueling is really cool and people don't want to stop dueling. And what happens is people start to specialize their weapons in dueling. So what happens is, as, as I, as a nobleman, am walking around town, I don't need a sword that can parry a blow from a poleaxe like this can, because I'm not, I'm not facing people with poleaxes, I'm facing other people that I'm dueling in the streets. So what happens is my sword gets a little bit longer, uh, and a little bit more narrow, and a little bit more specialized. And you can see this trend from away from mostly cutting to mostly thrusting. Now, that's not to say that this sword can't cut. We often see in the texts them telling us uh, when and how to throw cuts. Most often the target is either going to be at the head or, like I was talking before, cutting at the leg is still very popular. But the main focus is on the thrust. And you also see an interesting transition kind of in how people are standing, which is, as we've seen previously, a lot of this as you talked about, very proud stance, very vertical, very uh, kind of showy. Where as you start to specialize towards dueling, you're more, much more behind your sword, you're trying to make your body a lot smaller. And you also see, begin to see the idea of a back weighted stance that is like aggressively opening up as much space as possible, right? Uh, you also get a uh, more popular emphasis on a more narrow stance, right? So instead of my feet being really wide, suddenly my feet are really narrow, uh, and I've kind of adjusted how my body is. So uh, with this transition into specialized dueling weapon uh, based on thrusting, the actions start to change a little bit. Uh, but for example, some of them stay the same. So if I'm on the outside, <laughs> I might come here, and previously we're like, oh, I beat and put it here. I just do a smaller version and simply rotate my sword. But it's the same kind of action. Uh, one of the most critical pieces that starts to show up is called the Kavazion, which is the concept of when I feel like he's about to thrust me, right, I simply move my sword to the other side. And a lot of radio fencing is actually just us finding the right point to where we're safe to thrust until I can my point. And if you're not the one actually behind the sword, it kind of looks like we're just doing this, right? This is what we're doing, and then that's that, right? Uh, but actually what you're doing is each time that we do this, I'm changing, this is an exaggerated version, but I'm changing the angle, right? He moves his sword, so then I move my sword. And we're trying to find a way to get it so that we can safely thrust each other uh, without getting hit by the opponent's sword. And the speed that this action goes can get really, really fast, uh, which is why you get more and more specialized weapons and more and more specialized techniques. Uh, so to kind of bring it back to the footwork that Adrian was talking about, uh, we have what happens where if Ian Kavatsion's on me, and he's about to thrust me, I'm like, oh god, this point's coming towards my face, and see how far down he is on my sword? I can't, I can't Kavatsion, I can't get my sword under his without this big loop. So as this sword comes in, I need to move my body out of the way, and stab it. Uh, and this kind of becomes much more dramatic uh, <laughs> with these longer swords. Right, thank you. Uh, we also see the counter to this. So if uh, Ian does that to me, right, I'm here, he goes down, I dip under his sword, change muggles, get low, and kind of stab him down. And that's kind of the progression of the right here play, how it differs from the more cutting swords.
actually uh, a standard FEMA tournament cutter, but it is the correct dimensions for a late 15th century greatsword. Comes all the way up to my armpit. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple of different contexts. The first context will be in a wide situation. So remember the idea I mentioned Escanio de la Cornea being the guy with the banner, right? So they would usually put the great sword around the banner because that's uh, an incredible insult that the enemy manages to capture that. So we get a bunch of lads, big lads, and we get them plate armor that completely covers their body. Uh, and then when the more lightly armored infantry show up, you've got this devastating human weapon. Someone who is fundamentally not uh, killable with a lot of regular weapons, unless I get mobbed. Um, and, and I'm facing down people who at best would have some protection for their upper body, um, like plate armor for the arms and for the chest, and then some helmets, uh, and then a couple of people with shields. So, the route has happened, I'm surrounded, I've got a banner. based off of um, uh, magnetic detection of the <laughs> armor <laughs> down on the floor of the Mediterranean. Can you have part of this? So, yeah, so we can do, actually we can do this, because we have to take a few. So what's going to happen next is, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, we're gonna, the next part of the thing is going to be running a cloak and dagger class. We're, uh, working them primarily out of Achille Morazzo's Opera Nova text. That's the book that was going around, uh, that was uh, published in 16, uh, 1536. Uh, so we have limited room for that because we only have so much safety equipment. 